Hello, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Meredith. We would like to remind you that the Q&A feature is available, so feel free to send in your questions for our speakers throughout the discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator who joins us from Meredith, David Nelson. Thank you, Leah. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the health and narrative presentation today focused on measurement into action, what's next for health equity. I'm David Nelson, and I'm a strategy leader for Meredith. Just want to thank you for taking time to join us this afternoon. Today, we've got an ambitious program and a great set of speaker. So let's get started. You know, I'll start with a few comments. The healthcare industry has spent more than two decades studying and identifying the factors that lead to health disparities, which contribute to $93 billion in excess medical care costs in the US. But now multiple drivers from the COVID-19 pandemic to regulatory action to a looming economic recession underscore the urgent need for on the ground action. You know, we're seeing promising practices from all stakeholders in healthcare. That includes payers, employers, life sciences companies, providers, and government agencies. And our session today features a panel of industry leaders as we discuss the role these key stakeholders play in helping to reduce disparities and inequalities, lower costs, and improve outcomes. So we hope our presentation will provide some promising practices and insights you can apply in your organizations. Our panelists today are Dr. Irene Donkwa Mullen, a Chief Health Equity Officer and Deputy Chief Health Officer for Meredith, Stephanie Morrow from Ohio State University Health Plan, and who is the Director of Wellness and Health Coaching, and Dr. D. Ann Bielecki Haas, Chief Medical Officer for Paramount Health. Please feel free to ask questions, as Leah said, by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen. And we'll try to answer questions if we have time at the end of the call. So to start things off, I wanted to ask our panelists, uh, to please introduce themselves. And if they could just share one observation you have on the motivating factors that are driving the industry or your organization to take action in health equity. Let's start with Irene. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I'm really delighted to speak on to this important topic um, around next steps for health equity and what our priorities are. Um, I am Chief Health Equity Officer and Deputy Chief Health Officer at Meritive. Um, and so this means that I often think about how we design better solutions, how we leverage our data and health technologies for health equity. Um, thinking about the entire ecosystem and how we can optimize our data and our solution for improved clinical decision-making and, and, and health. Um, so I would say that th there are definitely several motivating factors, and I'm just going to mention a few, but first, there is a new scale of recognition. Um, I would say an unprecedented scale of recognition of the social inequities and health disparities, not only nationally, but also globally. Um, the global pandemic, um, as well as the uh, death of George Floyd in the past um, sparked activism and allyship and, and everyone is watching and on high alert as to what organizations or companies um, are doing to advance racial and social justice, including diversity and equity efforts. So um, definitely the pandemic had a huge impact on organizations and, and specifically the employees and patients, right? In domains ranging from mental health, um, their social health, physical health, well-being, um, and, and for a lot of hospitals or um, large employers, it impacted um, their, their work or their efforts or innovation. So I think, um, you know, for organizations now, addressing health inequities, promoting health equity, um, is the right thing to do, um, and also the best thing to do for, for um, the bottom line. And, and so a motivating action was 
uh, really the realization of the new circumstances um, post-COVID, creating opportunities for change um, because the way um, to do things um, no longer works and, and health equities inequities are costly. Thanks, Irene. Stephanie, how about in your organization? Thank you. Um, and I too would love to say thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conversation today. Um, a lot of this type of work has been very near and dear to my heart for quite some time. Um, and as Irene mentioned, a lot of the work really came to light through COVID. Um, just a little bit about my background. I've been a nurse for 35 plus years. And so um, right now my role is really working in an academic medical center and taking a close look at the health and well-being of our population um, and it often rolls over into really the care that we deliver to um, the community that we serve. Um, a lot of what we do in, in my team from a health coaching and a wellness perspective is look at that data. What are we learning from the, the health and well-being of our population? We look at personal health data from our uh, well-being assessments. We look at biometric data. Um, we partner those folks with resources to help them really look at how can they live their best healthy version of themselves um, through healthy eating, active living, emotional well-being, all those kinds of things. And one of the things that happened was a couple years prior to COVID, uh, my medical director and myself sat down with our data analytics team. We started looking at the data and we started realizing that some of the folks that we have, certain subsets of our population were not very engaged. And as we did a deeper dive, we really started noticing that, you know, we've got to find a way to engage the unengaged because we could actually narrow it down to certain different departments. And one of the things that we started realizing was, you know, some of the folks, because they're not near a computer or laptop, they're not as engaged. But at the same time, we have started taking it, we peel it back a little more and we were like, is this a technology challenge? Is this a health literacy challenge? Is this an ESL kind of challenge? Is this related to work schedules? Are people allowed to participate? And it really became clear as we started getting boots on the ground and going out and talking to different partners in the university and around that we were really missing a, a significant population. And a lot of it came down to social determinants of health and health equity. And so we started, you know, really meeting with you know, for instance, union leaders and different groups and saying, how do we engage this group? And so, you know, as, as mentioned earlier, I think COVID really kind of magnified it even more, what we thought we were looking at doing. Um, and then the, the social injustice kind of really brought even further um, awareness to everyone. And so really what we started to do was really take a look at how do we continue to keep building and learning more about these populations that have health risks that they're not gonna come and find us we're gonna to have to go find them. And one of the things that's the most important is you have to build the relationship, you have to build the rapport. And if, you're, if, the, if the goal is, you know, that spirit of moving things forward, you know, we really need to, to spend some time and, and be lifelong learners about how to do that. So excited to be part of this today and I will hand it back to you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate uh, getting us started off that way. And Dee, how about yourself? Thank you, David. And again, I'm very happy to participate in this discussion. I'm Deanne Bialecki Haas, and I'm a family physician by training and the chief medical officer for uh, Paramount Healthcare. And Paramount is the provider sponsored health plan of the Promedica Health System. And within our system, we've been working to address equity um, within our health plan, uh, within our acute and our ambulatory facilities for patients, for our staffs and for the communities that we serve. And um, I'll agree with um, you know, uh, our first two panelists that COVID has really magnified and, and brought some you know, things probably in, in a more escalated way to light. Um, we've started the work within the Promatica system a long time ago. And I think back at a turning point when I was working on the physician side of our organization in 2010, we um, started a pilot at the time to um, place uh, care coordinators in ambulatory practices. And um, I think as a physician, I, I was probably guilty of labeling, you know, patients as non-compliant and assume they all had access to care and um, services, but they chose not to address their health. 
And I guess, wow, like it, it was eye-opening. There were two of us who used our patient panels to um, onboard a navigator to really understand the process. And, you know, once we started identifying issues that, again, um, different levels of engagement, um, you know, patients more receptive sometimes to talking to a nurse navigator, um, once we started to identify those SDOH needs and maybe underlying behavioral health conditions, we were really able to start doing the real work and closing the gaps and helping people get access and get the services in a way that, you know, um, worked for them. And so, like, not only is this not only the... Um, the right thing to do. Um, more importantly, I feel like a failure to address the issues of equity and, and SDOH gaps is really a barrier to any further improvement in health outcomes. And, um, you know, I feel like we have to be careful not to just rest on saying, well, our, our scores are improving, our metrics as a plan are improving without taking the deepest dive to identify those subgroups and to ensure the outcomes and the access to care are really improving for all. Um, you know, so it, again, it's, um, we're really at a great point where we now have um, increased stakeholder engagement, we've really cast a, a brighter light on this issue, and now is the opportunity to really um, continue the work in this space. Yeah, I, I'm really understanding, I mean, from your introductions and, and initial comments, that, you know, this is something that all of you have been involved with and has been a major issue for a decade or more for us, but we're at a special inflection point right now to focus a spotlight uh, on what we can do to really take a step function uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, our, our next question is really around data evidence and implementation. So uh, Stephanie, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. How are you seeing data and evidence used in your organization or maybe some best practices in other places to measure and manage the health equity initiatives uh, that you've been involved with or, or you've seen? And are there any challenges or misconceptions or misunderstandings that uh, organizations on this call might uh, watch out for? Sure. You know, um, as I mentioned earlier, we really have used our um, health and wellness data and, and really trying to understand what's going on with these different health risks as we prioritize our next steps. Um, We've also, you know, really taken a closer look at some of the, I think Meredith has social vulnerability, vulnerability index where we look at poverty. We look at limited English. We look at different neighborhood typologies. We do the census track. And it's been really helpful to get a better understanding and then take that data and look at em employee zip codes and see how is this, how is this line up? And again, I look at engaging the unengaged as kind of like my mantra that, you know, I talk about um, our employer is very supportive, our health plan, we're a self-insured health plan is very supportive. And now we have a lot of leaders that have been really, you know, tuned into saying, what can we do and what does it look like? Because what might work here might be something different over here. Um, I think some of the challenges that we've had along the way is we know that, you know, data will show that neighborhoods with sup with that poor social determinants of health kind of um, values and, and those metrics actually, you know, is getting reinforced. You know, we're looking at who has a primary care, who doesn't have a primary care. And again, those, those creative and diverse ways in which we engage. Um, we put together, like I said earlier, um, uh, some food programs, um, added some health coaches. We've tried to package it as health and well-being. But we're really trying to use data to drive, you know, where do we want to prioritize? How do we reach the population that, you know, are really not as engaged? Um, I think the other piece, too, that's really important to talk about is, you know, one of the things that we had to do even, even just as recently as this fall with some of our programs is we started adding some new translations of some of the materials around some of our health and wellness programs and our disease management programs that we offer. Um, through our health and well-being product, we have access to other languages. And so I think that that language barrier needs to be also something that we really try to spend time with. Um, the misconceptions and misunderstandings. Wow. This is one, um, and I think Dee mentioned this a little bit ago, when you first get started, you think you know. And then all of a sudden, you spend a little more time and you find a relationship and a rapport and a bit of a, a trust that starts to develop and you really learn more. Um, and you really start to understand, you know, the SDOH, the health equity, 
and what really happens. And suddenly those takeaways, they become very real because those folks, once they really trust you, they will tell you, this is what I really need. This is what's really going on. You know, by the end of the month, my refrigerator doesn't have a whole lot of fresh food in it. Do you have any suggestions? And so, you know, as we know, COVID brought that forward for a lot of people. It was magnified for some of those that deal with health equity. So huge opportunity for data to help drive it um, and really also measure the impact and the improvement along the way. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Dee, how about from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I love um, Stephanie's comments about, um, you know, the continued learning. And, and I think one of the greatest challenges I see is just accepting that we don't always have the data. So mm -hmm. there may be additional learnings and additional data to come. Um, on the health plan, I think we struggle with the data gap. Um, approximately 40% of our members like choose not to answer questions related to race and ethnicity and language. And so, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know. And in the short term, I think we do have an opportunity, especially with uh, Meredith, um, to um, use census tract data um, to make some assumptions to help us better understand our populations. And then in the long term, I think we have an opportunity to really um, to work to capture this data and, and to share it across our health system. Because sometimes we find um, on the provider side, they may have more information than the health plan has. And um, sometimes has the health plan, we have limited opportunities to capture that. So we may have members that work with our health coaches and our case managers, and there may be more information shared. But for a lot of members, they have very little interaction with the health plan. Again, to Stephanie's point about engaging the unengaged, it's really trying to understand who are those members that other than some, you know, claims that are processed, um, you know, we, we don't have opportunity to collect their information on a regular basis. Um, yeah, and I think just doing better at the why. Why do we, why do, we do this? What's our opportunity? Great. Thanks, Dee. I appreciate it. And and Irene, how about yourself around data evidence and, and implementation? What are you saying? Yeah. Uh, so I, I do appreciate um, that you combining data with evidence and implementation. In addition to being a physician, I'm also a scientist at heart. Um, and at Meritive, we use data. So I, I always say data entrusted in us by you know, our clients, um, along with what we know to be the science evidence or the science base to inform, you know, our work to inform progress in improving health equity or improving health experiences. Um, and, and we know data is critical. Um, having this, the right data is key. Um, combining it with the right evidence is also even, um, you know, important because we, you know, data can be used for tracking and measuring progress, right, towards achieving health equity. And, and measurement allows us to identify where we can intervene effectively. Um, so an example of how we're using data and evidence in our organization, I'll give you one. Um, for example, we worked with a multi-stakeholder collaborative in the state of California that was focused on measuring and providing their consumers and their participants with hospital performance information in, in California. So um, the collaborative included representatives from hospitals and purchase of, purchases of healthcare, health plans, consumer groups, as well as the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. And what we did was we used publicly available geographic information data and combined it with the hospitals uh, patient population data to identify hospitals that exhibit um, high performance along with quality measures in serving um, their populations with high social needs. And so as part of the study, we're able to create a standardized comparative hospital level social needs index that integrates patient origin information along with the geographic social need index. And so we've, we were able to work with the um, collaborative to rank all 313 hospitals in California with very interesting results. Um, 
you know, so for example, we wanted to identify those core social and structural determinants of health that were strongly correlated with a clinical quality measure or a patient measure or a patient experience measure um, with the communities in which those patients reside. So that, for example, if broader factors such as inadequate housing or food deserts were major factors in those locations in which patients reside, then you know that um, a business case can be used in those communities uh, for, for addressing those social determinants or structural determinants. Um, so we wanted to look for these best practices among hospitals that served a lot of high needs patients um, on various quality measures, such as hospital acquired infection or you know, um, patient experience or readmission uh, to help drive and prioritize investment. These are some of the kinds of things that are helpful with data-driven analysis, right? To help prioritize investments and, um, and also help to optimize both social determinants of health and investments and, and organizational um, commitment. And this, this was um, published in Health Affairs. I mean, I agree. I think a, a huge misconception is the scope of collaboration that's needed to advance health equity. Certainly, um, addressing health disparities, addressing social determinants of health requires collaboration. Um, and, and this is, you know, the challenge that we also need to look for is that the, there needs to be evidence behind those data-driven decisions. Um, just like data can be biased, evidence also can be biased. Um, and so that right data and evidence can really uncover those critical associations, right, between the data and the interventions um, to help with our uh, make a case for investments. Yeah, and I'll add, you know, within our system, we, um, we have used the opportunity being a part of an integrated system to, you know, mm -hmm. screen and identify those social needs, mm -hmm. um, connect our, um, our patients and our health plan members to financial opportunity centers mm. and to food clinics. And then for those mutual patients that are a patient in our health system and part of our health plan, we have the opportunity to be able to follow the claims and the medical expense and to really see if, if this type of an intervention, um, you know, drives better outcomes and drives better bottom line financials. And, um, clearly we see positive trends in that direction. And, um, you know, not only do we look for, you know, our patient or member reported needs, but then we use some of those, um, you know, census track to reach out and again, try to engage patients and members who may not have reached out otherwise to let them know about resources and, you know, and to let them have an opportunity to connect with those resources based on what we believe we may know about, you know, their, um, you know, social vulnerability, you know, indices. Yeah, I would jump into really quick, David, and say, you know, it's been fascinating to look at how word of mouth about programs and resources and, and engagement makes a big difference. Um, I think that's been probably the biggest thing where we look at the data and then we identify a few. Um, and my biggest example is we have a bush on a peck program and I've, uh, you know, it's, it's really engaging people around health and wellness, but it's around fresh food. And we started a mini pilot program this fall um, at another new location. Um, and that was a request out, out of a DEI uh, group from another department. And to make a long story short, what was fascinating is we started with week one and the, the number of, we had like 20 people, we're now up to about 35, 40 people because they'll say, can I bring my friend? Can I bring my friend? Can they come and, and learn more about this? And so you're exactly right. It's like getting them involved and helping them learn about those resources as employees. But then it even came to the point, well, do you have to be an employee to come to this? Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, the answer is yes. But yes, to your point, once you get that zip code and you understand those risks and you build that relationship, it is fascinating to see how word of mouth makes a big difference. Yeah, at Meredith, we found a, a lot of value in tapping into some of the census uh, data sets, as well as other uh, data sets that are out there on STOH uh, and social, you know, social vulnerabilities uh, to help 
uh, our clients target uh, various uh, programs that you're you're involved with, and um, and oftentimes it also leads to some collaborations. So when you're thinking about partnership and collaboration, each one of you sort of like touched on it a little bit, but D, could you say a little bit more around where you see the best opportunities for collaboration and partnerships between, say, plans, providers, employers, or government uh, to help address equity? I think you you uh, spent a little bit of time on that already within your own organization. Yeah, I think um, first, you know, it's it's really trying to collect the um, the data and understand what the unique needs are for a given population, um, employee group, or you know, community. And then it's really looking at who are those partners already in the community that have, in some cases, the resources and the programs may already be there. And it's really a matter of maybe um, augmenting them a little bit, maybe relocating them, um, you know, getting them in close proximity to the people who need the services, and then um, connecting the two. Um, those, you know, employees or members that are in need of the services to the programs. A lot of times it's, um, you know, it's just a, a lack of awareness of, of what, you know, resources are out there. Um, so I think it's, and, and again, from community to community, there may be common themes for sure, you know, um, finances, financial uh, coaching, um, need for jobs and training, transportation, food, um, behavioral health needs. Um, but, you know, some, depending on the community, may have a little different hierarchy level of priority. But really, once you can identify it, then it's it's really, you know, pulling the resources you have and augmenting them, but then looking at where do you not have a, a resource or a program and who can best help to, to help build and create that. In some cases, it, it may be, you know, a health system. In some cases, though, there's a community organization that, um, you know, has the know-how and, and really um, can really play that role. We've certainly seen the, the collaboration of stakeholders and when you're bringing new energy, it's nice to, to uh, uh, piggyback on efforts that have already started underway or channels that have already been established. Irene, how about you? Uh, partnership and collaboration, uh, any comments there? Yeah, I, I would add, and I, I totally agree. I mean, I would add that the possibilities for partnerships and collaborations are endless, right? They're only limited by the kinds of organizations that we choose to partner with. Um, health basically runs in all policies in all sectors. Uh, and But I would also say collaborative community support is, is crucial. Um, and especially around interventions addressing social determinants of health um, being key. Uh, in, in terms of data, um, you know, all stakeholders, I mean, payers, I mean, healthcare providers, um, I think everyone is in a very unique position because of access to critical health data, right? And so you have your access to administrative claims data, and um, but there's also publicly available data. And so um, collaboration, there's a need to collaborate, collaborate um, really and, um, you know, identify successful or promising strategies while you're looking at data points. Um, so so I, I would say that that's key. Definitely um, casting a wide net and, and collaborating with non-traditional partners, faith-based organizations, um, soup kitchens and, and um, community-based organizations are key. Yeah, we certainly have seen uh, uh, different facets of the, the data picture being brought to bear on community organizations yeah. uh, based on, on what position a stakeholder sits in. Stephanie, how about yourself? On the theme of uh, partnership and collaboration, uh, what are your thoughts? You know, I think one of the, the most interesting things when thinking about that whole concept of partnering and collaboration is that really timing is perfect right now uh, for collaboration and partnerships as we move through this pandemic and all the life learnings that have taken place. Again, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. 
And I know everybody who's been through this pandemic and and some of the the, the learnings that have gone through it, we've we now know. And so it's not there's no reason to turn our head and say we don't anymore. Um, and so the timing is really is 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 critical. Um, employers and health plans, what we see, are extremely engaged in prioritizing health and well-being. Um, the clinicians are trying to figure out how do we see all the people that need to be seen? How do we meet them where they are? And then at the same time, uh, we're actually starting to take a closer look at those workplace cultures because things have changed since COVID. What does that look like? And how are we whole person, real people 24 seven? Because in a lot of many ways, I know most of the people on this call, there's not as much of a break in the day anymore. So really taking a look at how do we partner? How do we look at employee benefits? How do we look at this access to health care? Um, you know, telehealth took off like crazy. You know, is that really helping and benefiting the folks with that have some of those social determinants of health like it could? Or do we need to do more work to help them understand how to access that technology and those resources? Um, I think the other piece that I've noticed a lot, and I'm sure mo many on this call have, is the agenda topics that are part of these meetings that we have in, in healthcare today, it is unbelievably normal that we're actually having topics that say health equity, DEI, social determinants of health. How do we align the resources? Are we operationalizing things? What are the organizational goals? And you know, prior to COVID, you might hear some of that, but since we've come through COVID and all the learnings, those are common themes on all of these different meeting agendas, which really helps tee everything up for that collaboration and partnership. The other thing that we've looked at is, you know, in the past, the historic patterns of how we've done things in healthcare have created gaps in care. And they have really, at times, somewhat negatively impacted health outcomes. And a lot of that's unintended, but that's what happened. And so now we have, you know, a whole new group of people and organizations, both internal as well as community, as well as governmental, who are really coming together and saying, we need to shift these health outcomes and really take a closer look at how we, what we do, what we do. Um, I think from our health plan perspective and OSU and being an employer and a healthcare facility, we are implementing a lot of new approaches with your partnering with the community or working internally. Um, as many people say, you know, it takes a village and the power of we, well, both of those things really come in handy. Uh, those phrases have to be top of mind. Um, and, I'll, and I'll close by saying, you know, right now, there's no doubt we are excited about the work that's actually taking place. And it's going to be really critical as we move forward that we take those insights and lessons learned and make sure we always keep that curious mind to see what those collaborative efforts look like. And, and uh, you mentioned something that triggers a thought is COVID also created a bit of uh, a wave of delayed care. Mm -hmm. are, he and, and Stephanie, are you, you're right on the front lines there. Are you seeing much in terms of equity come up, you know, converge with the delayed care wave that we're seeing? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely the potential, um, especially because in some situations, capacity for services mm -hmm. is... Yeah. Um, you know, kind of maximize, but, you know, everyone can't get those services as quickly as they want to. And so those that have fewer barriers are the ones that are getting it. So I think we have to be really careful that we look at, you know, where, where are we missing and, and how do we need to ensure that we're um, creating opportunity for all and, and how are we expanding services? Um, and, and I, you know, thinking about, um, you know, collaboration and thinking about employers. And, and I think about the, you know, kind of this great resignation that we're all a part of. And, you know, all employers, whether they're what we see are smaller employers or our larger employer customers, you know, their workforce is incredibly important to them. And it's, and I think they are also uh, coming on board in maybe a way that they hadn't thought of it before, but, you know, it's, it's important for them to, um, you know, maintain their workforce, you know, develop an adequate workforce, but then also to keep them healthy and to, you know, um, to keep them at work. And so helping to identify those, you know, those unmet needs or gaps that would, you know, prevent them from being able to get to work or to be at their best when they're on the job are really, you know, now more employer concerns than they had been in the past. Yeah, yeah. 
Stephanie, any other comments you might have on that? I was going to say, I would agree with everything that Dee's saying. And I think the other right. piece of it is, is really understanding where telehealth does fit in. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's something that is just going to continue to evolve. But at the same time, as the, the provider and the clinician, where does the balance happen where you've got clinicians and providers who are going full go, you know, 10, 12 hours a day sometimes with in-person, but then they've also got this telehealth happening in between visits that they're trying to do. And then there's another piece called my chart and all of that. And so it's like, how do you balance it out to make sure that the care is actually being delivered, you know, as Dee said, from a health equity perspective, but we want to also make sure that the people who need the care know how to access it um, because there's a, there's a really steep learning curve that a lot of people are trying to, to navigate as they move through this. Yeah, I think digital equity is a thing that sometimes might be overlooked in this conversation. Mm -hmm. So about the digital aspects you brought up are, are key uh, to, to being successful in uh, focusing on this issue uh, going forward. Um, last uh, question. In terms of focus, you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of things, uh, and and I always like to think about you know what are some key takeaways or a key takeaway. So there are a lot of directions organizations can go into to address uh, address uh, equity and social determinants. Um, can you maybe focus on what are the key areas necessary to measure and address equity and achieve the outcomes? Uh, that you're aiming for? I know we've talked about a lot of things. You may have touched on some of them. What would you think is a key takeaway or a key focus? Uh, and and what's, what are you most hopeful about uh, in, uh, in this dialogue and in this time where we're spotlighting this issue? Um, why don't we start with Irene uh, first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Great, great question. And, and a lot um, in here. I mean, definitely there are a lot of directions that organizations can go in to address health equity. But I think the most important is to first define and communicate your goals for health equity. Um, defining what achieving health equity means for the organization. Um, and, and so I like to think first big picture, you know, what are your goals? Um, I think for the healthcare ecosystem in general, an overarching goal should be that you know, all people live and thrive in communities where resources work well, right? Systems need to be equitable um, and create no harm or exacerbate existing harms. But I think most important, given what we know, the definition of health equity is given everyone sort of the power or the conditions or the resources or the opportunities to achieve their optimal health. You don't want to disadvantage any population from achieving this potential um, because of socially determined circumstances. Um, and so that could be sort of an overarching goal. I, I often also talk about a goal giving healthcare providers or um, organization stakeholders with equipping them with the, with the consciousness or the compassion or the tools and resources to address the inequities. I mean, that's, that's an overarching goal to me, that they need to be equipped um, and they need to look at embedding racial justice, social justice into their all aspects of their policies. But I think in terms of um, if there's a big picture or a, a take home message, there, there are two things I want to um, everyone to remember in terms of take home for, especially investment, right? The worst all time social determinants of health in terms of its effects on disease, in terms of poorer outcomes, is social isolation. Mm -hmm. A lot of studies have found out that social isolation carries the same health risk as smoking or obesity. Um, and an individual that's experiencing social isolation most likely suffers from mental health, depression, cognitive decline. And so individuals with chronic comorbidities that are experiencing loneliness or isolation has the highest risk factor for poor outcomes. And it can be up to four times more costly. Um, and so thinking about that and integrating that into sort of a framework or a strategy or a measure is social isolation. And the second is 
Based on um, a meta-analysis of nearly 50 studies, what we found out that is that um, the social factors of education, residential segregation, lack of social support, and poverty, these accounted for a third of disparities in premature death or death in, in the United States. And so um, likelihood of premature death increases as income goes down, the stress that comes with all these um, social determinants of health, these key ones have a detrimental effect, even on children who remain in these circumstances across their lifespan. And so I think this is where we can leverage sort of the science, the evidence and data um, around this and, and, and think about building a health equity dashboard. Um, one of the things that we're doing at Meritif is to work with partners in building a dashboard to vi visualize the data and think about those metrics to include because data visualization is a necessary part mm -hmm. of the data and evidence analytic process. Um, and a health equity dashboard can help you track. Um, it can be simple as capturing social demographic information, slicing by race ethnicity, or it can be as robust as integrating patient level, community level um, interventions or determinants of health as, as sort of a, a case management tool. And so, um, we've gone through, uh, you know, a health equity dashboard process with a health system partner, um, and and identified key elements, you know, and and um, and there's a lot of agreements, you know, across hospitals, across health system, across payers, on on measuring um, different um, pulling different measurements for health equity, and and, and I'm happy to share more, um, you know, later about our entire process the design thinking process that we integrated um, while we're building the health equity dashboard wireframes. I think I'm really hopeful about opportunities um, to the opportunities that are to come uh, or that are here to leverage data and, and technologies. And there's overall um, enthusiasm, overwhelming support for this, uh, for stakeholders in the ecosystem. I've been in health equity health disparities. I came to, you know, Meritive six years ago as chief health equity officer. So we've been thinking about health equity uh, for quite a long time before the organizations were hiring chief health equity officers. So I'm really hopeful um, with the strong public sentiment. Um, I'm hopeful about, um, you know, using our promising proposals and working together and strengthening our safety nets and um, expanding coverage, access, and all that. So I look forward to, um, you know, the, the future, which I think it's, is bright and, and um, to, you know, address disparities in, in care affecting patients. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Really appreciate it. Stephanie, how about yourself? You know, if we're thinking about focus and, and what you're most hopeful about. Sure. Um, I'll kind of uh, echo a lot of what Irene said, and I'm sure Dee will too. Um, I think one of the most important things is as we continue to focus on health equity, um, you know, the data is mission critical. Uh, we really need to know what the data is telling us so we can, you know, be just consistently learning more about the populations that we serve and those, how are we going to measure if we're making an impact? Because, you know, that's one of the things, I mean, we don't want to keep doing things if, it, if they're not making a difference. At the same time, sometimes it takes more time to demonstrate an impact and see whether or not what you're doing makes a difference. So there's a real delicate balancing act there. Um, we know that social determinants health really comes from, and, and again, Irene said this beautifully, and it really looks at you know the economic stability. You know what's going on in those neighborhoods. Where's the social? What's the community context related to education? You know, for us, it's the healthcare access too. It's like, my goodness, what do they, what do they have access to? I mean, we have a free clinic. Is that enough, or do we need to have some other primary care options available so that people can get access to the care they need? And especially when you take that deeper dive into those zip codes, where we live, where we work, where we play, makes all the difference in the world. You know, when you really look at see what happens, what your zip code means about your health and health equity and well-being. So I think there's a lot to to know as we really look at that type of data. 
Um, you know, as we've talked about on this webinar, there's lots of different challenges and opportunities that, you know, that we have. Um, I think there's the conversations are happening. Um, so I have a lot of excitement and encouragement in my, you know, in my world and, and the teams that I work with at the health plan, as well as throughout the university and, you know, with the employer kind of leading the way. And we really look at the fact that status quo is not okay. Um, I think a lot of people are realizing we just can't keep doing what we've been doing because it's really not working very well. So we really need to think differently, get those boots on the ground. Let's not make assumptions about things and miss key opportunities that are going to impact the outcomes so that we improve that health equity. Um, as far as if I were talking to an organization, I would say keep it simple to start first. You know, find those two or three priorities that are going to be meaningful to the populations you serve. Gather that data, get those metrics and see what it is that you really want to follow up on. And I think the biggest challenge that many people run into in many organizations is the operationalization of implementing, like do something about it. We have a lot of time and a lot of ability to keep talking about it, but let's, let's implement, let's pilot, let's go. Um, I think the last piece on that and where I've got a, you know, a lot of hope and excitement is, you know, we've taken a close look at our zip codes, we look at our data, we look at our departments, we look at the employers, we look at the risk data. And as I've mentioned numerous times, we look at engaging the unengaged. And we've really done some redesign on our programs because we know that there's opportunities to continuously improve. And I will share one of the most important next steps that I have from a HOPE perspective is um, we're in the process of hiring a, um, a new community health worker. Um, and that community health worker is gonna be based at the health plan. And they're gonna be part of the, the team of, of clinicians, my team, our disease management team, our enhanced case management team, but they're gonna be placed out inside different departments at the university so that they get to build that relationship and have access to them on a more regular basis. So I'm excited that we have, you know, the, the momentum that we have and these conversations are taking place. And I think most importantly, the opportunity for us to continue to work together with our employers, our health plans, our um, nonprofits in the community, and then those governmental res resources and things. I do think we've come a long way, but we've got a lot of work to do. So it's kind of exciting, really, when you look at where we've been and where we're going. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, Dee, some of your final comments sure. about focus and, and hopeful outlook. Yeah, so when I think about focus areas, I, there's one key area of focus and that's a, around collaboration. And I think of it on two levels from a health plan perspective. So one is the collaboration between the, um, the payer and providers. So, you know, how do we use tools that we have as a health plan that may be data, that may be, you know, the use of value-based uh, incentives and programs to work with providers to kind of engage and motivate them in this space and to really set expectations that they are, um, you know, looking at, at their quality and their work with an equity lens and, and really helping to um, support them in the work and, and you know, um, reward them in the work. And then secondly, um, also looking at the, um, uh, the collaboration among payers. And so one of the things I failed to mention is um, really the... Um, in Ohio, in the Medicaid space, the Ohio uh, managed care plans for the last two years now, going on three years, were, were challenged with the onset of the pandemic to really look at some of the quality we work, uh, the quality work we do in a different way, and to actually work together on it. So a lot of barriers were broken down and um, working to um, share best practices, working to um, like, um, uh, you know, to look at, um, you know, has a collective group of payers providing care for Medicaid individuals in the state, you know, how could we improve COVID vaccinations and the impact of, of COVID on some of the most vulnerable people in Ohio, as well as looking at um, improving the care of diabetes and improving, um, you know, um, uh, neonatal outcomes and in looking at this together, finding those areas where we have the greatest challenge and then, um, you know, working collectively so that it's not, you know, five or seven plans all doing a different thing, but that we are pulling together, that we're listening to our stakeholders out there, 
understanding what the issues are, and then developing initiatives that really help. Um, and they they're the same. So we're trying to create less, you know, provider abrasion and and really um, help move things along in that space. Um, what am I hopeful for? Um, I think I am hopeful that um, we're at a part in this process where we continue to have an opportunity to better educate the stakeholders on the why. Um, that we, you know, mm -hmm. have an opportunity to really celebrate our diversity and, um, you know, to really um, help find those needs and develop those targeted approaches to close gaps. Um, and that the motivation and the engagement that will come along the way and that are all that are developing, you know, as we speak, will help really move us to those best possible outcomes. Thanks, Dee. I uh, really appreciate those, those comments. So before we close today's session, I just want to make sure that we thank uh, Dr. Irene Danquamullen, uh, Chief Health Equity Officer and Deputy Health Officer for Meritive, uh, Stephanie Morrow, Ohio State University Health Plan Director of Wellness and Health Coaching, and of course, Dee Ann uh, Bialecki Haas, uh, Chief Medical Officer for Paramount Health. So thank you all for sharing your perspectives today. What I really heard was, you know, key themes around collaboration, uh, ensuring we have data and data exchange and visual, visualization. I, I love that idea of keep it simple and take action working collectively with those uh, other stakeholders that you could be working with. You know, I'm hopeful that we've shared some uh, useful practices and insights today. Uh, we just have a limited time, but uh, we're your partners. So please feel free to reach out to uh, Meritive with any additional questions you have for us about the topics we've discussed today or any others. Um, so I just want to thank our attendees for taking an hour out and uh, joining this session as well. So thank you very much. And we can conclude our session now. Thank you. Thank you to David and all of our speakers. Please visit our website at hlth.com to catch up on all Health Go Live webinars. And join us in Las Vegas, November 13th through 16th for Health 2022.